Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the Discord chat. We are broadcasting live and we should be broadcasting live on YouTube, all going well. Uh, so welcome to you if you're listening in there. And a big thank you and welcome to Lorne Lanning, Chief Creative Officer and co-founder here at Oddworld Inhabitants, for joining us today. How are you doing, Lorne? I'm doing good, Dan. Thanks for thanks for having me. I actually I really look forward to these uh, sessions. You know, I love uh, being able to dive more into the lore that you always feel that we weren't able to pack into games. You know, but there's a whole universe there, so I really enjoy these. And I'm looking forward to this one. Awesome, thanks. And uh, yeah, we you know we really enjoy you being here with us, and I certainly enjoy it as well. Uh, learning from you every episode. So, as a reminder. Oddworld uh, Soulstorm Enhanced Edition released yesterday on Steam. Woohoo! Woo uh, so you can go and uh, buy it now, or you can uh, download the demo and get a taste of the action. Uh, for those of you asking out there, the wishlist campaign is complete and the community unlocked the content. So, congrats to you all and uh, really appreciate all of the efforts that you went to for us there. Uh, we are working behind the scenes to package all of that content up. And we'll announce very soon on our social media channels and Discord when you'd be able to get that uh, from our website. Uh, so for this episode, we're going to switch things up a little bit and focus more on the community Q&A, uh, as we've received lots of questions. And as you all know, Lorne does like to talk. Uh, so... <laughs> A quick question, uh, just before we get started, and this is from uh, Nick on the uh, Veterans Discord channel. So he loved the uh, concept art for Boneworks and asks, have you got any uh, more that you can share with me to share with the community, and not just for Soulstorm, for all of the games? <laughs> well, there's, <laughs> there's certainly a lot of stuff out there. Uh, I'm, I got a file online. Um, what would I do, Dan, if I wanted to get that? to you if you post that in the discord um or oh, either uh, to me on discord and then i can filter that through okay great um well while we're chatting that would be cool and uh, okay. yeah that'd be awesome i'm just going to toss in something real quick this was not ours but it was one of the images that was inspiring um the idea of what the bone works level would be and then here was another again this one was from uh robot carnival anyone any anime fans who don't know about Robot Carnival, um, that's a cardinal sin. So if you don't know, you'll have to find out. And it was just one of those original original anime shorts that was mind-blowing uh, by the group that was uh, company was involved with, um, you know, Akira and uh, other great projects at a time at the, in that era back in the 80s. But um, Robot Carnival is one of my favorite inspiring things. And... Uh, I think I got some more sheets here. James Payek. Uh, I'm not sure that I gave. Did I give the nine drawing sheet to you, the sketches that he did? Yes. yes yeah, okay. Yes, totally. So you have yep. that. That was one of the most robust, you know. And then um, but I'm going to give you another right now. I'll dump that into the group. <laughs> I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but that's okay. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> I'm, someone might have been planning a book or something I wasn't aware of. But um, you're seeing some stuff definitely for the first time. James Payek was a guy that I, I really had hoped to have the opportunity to uh, work with back on a different project that was actually uh, Thor, and I was helping some friends out. And he started doing some great sketches and, and stuff. And then uh, it just didn't, the, the circumstances of things just didn't work out. But he was amazing. And uh, so finally, I got to work with him on Soulstorm, and you're seeing the work. And sketches that he was doing for uh, for the the bone works, and uh, we talked a little bit about that, right? Like why we weren't able to do it and stuff. That was our our goal with James, and I, I don't think I have a bunch more images of him. But if I come across them, I'll, I'll post those too. Here's another inspirational piece. Yeah, this is awesome. Uh, really appreciate this. Yeah, you bet. And and then you know, in hindsight, I always look back and I go, oh, we should use that one instead, but we didn't use any. So <laughs> I guess. This, no irony there. 
if, if those of you li- listening and you missed the last episode uh, where we talked about Boneworks and uh, what led to Lawn sharing these images, go go back and have a listen to that episode. It's on uh, it's on the YouTube channel. It's also on Anchor dot fm forward slash oddworld inc and um you know you're getting a live taste of some concept art and some inspiration uh, which is great to see and you know it's really appreciative that you're able to share that live in the moment with the community another great reason if you're listening on youtube to join the discord it's discord.gg forward slash oddworld so please come over and uh, see for yourself right Shall we dive right into some uh, community questions? Because we've got quite a lot to get through. Okay, sure. So uh, the, the the topic of uh, this episode is the species of Oddworld. So we're going to be looking at the Gluckens, Madokens, Sligs, and Vikers. And we received quite a lot of questions, and some of them are really, really good. Uh, so we're going to get started. So the first one is from Toady and says... Hey Lorne, I've always been curious if you have ever planned or written a corrupted or antagonistic Madokan character, or if all the Madokans are by default good-natured and innocent. Thank you very much. Your imagination and stories continues to inspire me. Well, thank you. Thank you for that compliment and all, and I'm glad the stories have had that impact. I can tell you a little bit about the origins of how I think about all our races which is um, almost always driven from history, little known history, the history of our world, behavioral practices of uh, various types of entity, particularly authoritative institutions, and my (laughs) severe distrust of all that. And so in the course of um, the Mudakins, there's a little bit of storytelling differences between like the novel, the film, or the game. And the thing with the games is we always have to, the experienced game designers when I started were like, you have to beat them over the head with the clear direction. You know, and it was earlier in gaming in the 90s, but it was it was really sort of drilled into me that there was no room for ambiguity in a game that had like a lot of action or something like this. And I don't mean to overgeneralize, but that was a, basically a theme. <clears throat> and I had to pay attention to it over the years because when I did get too ambiguous about certain things, people would wind up confused. And in a game, it just doesn't take long for you to be confused to lose interest. So if it was a movie script, it would be quite a bit different from when it was a game script, particularly in the 90s. Um, I think games like Last of Us and some of those really kind of amazing narrative games are getting are taking it to another level where it feels like you're dealing with more circumstances that come from traditional, you know, movies and great television series and things like that. So I think it's all changing, but in the effort of keeping protagonists and antagonists more clear, um, I had written a lot about corruption and one of the Mudokans to reflect that once they found their freedom, two things are observed by the audience. One, uh, it feels like a great day to celebrate that everyone is now free of a tyrant. And then two, what happens on the following day. And so I wanted to uh, create a landscape of Mudokins. And hopefully this is this is coming with, you know, more, more uh, product. But I always hesitate to promise what's coming due to, you know, financing. Things cost a lot of money. Lots of things can go wrong. But on, the, on that thread of what would happen when they're free is then I really wanted to radicalize the different perceptions and attitudes of known models for governance. So we would have a sect that would be striving for egalitarianism. You would have another sect that is swearing it's only about communism. You would have another sect that's getting enticed by capitalism. You would have another sect that's becoming, uh, in various ways, uh, religious extremists. You would have others that are becoming transhumanists. And so we would have these like Abe, innocent Abe being bombarded with, you, we must do it this way, you know, by, by an emerging radical class of representing kind of every different known spectrum of political, I wouldn't say party, but let's say group or trend. And I just wanted to make fun of them all, you know, kind of like how South Park does. It's like, no, we're, none are safe in this land <laughs> to be made fun of <laughs> and taken to extremes. So we just wanted to turn up the extreme possibilities of all these, these different cases. And in that is corruption. As soon as people get 
the idea that they can have something else and they, they fall to the appetite of what they could have and they start getting seduced by that, that's when we tend to see that uh, they start caring less about others often as a behavioral pattern in life. And so I really wanted that to accelerate. So it would just be bombarded with these, you must do it this way. No, you must do it this way. You must do it this way. You must do it this way. And uh, and trying to, Abe, Abe's whole basis is uh, right at the core of humanity's dilemma. You know, the empathetic, the innocent being wrapped up in all these complications that can set people on different courses that uh, start to polarize other parties, other things. So the Mudakins would start going at each other in different groups, much like if we go back on Earth's history to uh, the beginning of Christianity, let's say, there was lots of different sects and they didn't all agree. And some were really hostile to one another, you know? And so that was kind of a perfect case of, they're all claiming to be following a certain leader with a certain uh, ideal. And then eventually they're hunting down the others because they don't agree exactly. And that's just one case, but there's all kinds of these um, fragmentations throughout history with almost any large group. And so, yes, there was a lot of intent to bring in. And as we go forward, we definitely get into uh, the possibility for more subtle, more ambiguous storytelling that leaves you know, a bit of a mystery and opens up another can of worms, so, so to speak. And so the idea of corrupt Mudarkans is absolutely in the DNA of Oddworld. We just haven't had a chance to see it yet. And a lot of this would kind of be revealed when uh, Abe gets to find the mother find Sam and what's going on there. And then those aspects uh, get to it's just things I witnessed um, people, people with, uh, you know, that were abused or all, all kinds of various circumstances um, where people were having hard times in unjust sort of circumstances, you know, and I would consider, you know, a kid who's abused at home is an unjust circumstance where the authority is really, you know, not fair and mean and whatever else can go with that. So in that, it's like they're all human and everything that's human is capable of being corrupted. And this is something I just personally never forget, but that's a really long winded answer. And I promise not to do that to <laughs> the idea of Mudokan corruption. So I hope if we can get into um, the third piece of the, of the epic, you know, of the quintology for real, then we're going to start to see that. And I just put that with ifs because no one will say you promised, but um, you know, I hope to be able to deliver these things. Awesome. That, that was such a great answer, and thank you very much for that. Next question is from uh, Susie. Uh, I noticed Abe and Alf are covered in old scars. Yes. Some of which look like they've been cruelly treated. What was the protocol for Madokans who either got injured or were sick during work? Did they receive any help, even if it was rudimentary, or did they patch each other up, or were they just abandoned to die? So uh, that's a great question, and I'm um, thinking of the most concise way, <laughs> concise way to answer it. So the scars that you're mostly seeing on them is, is from work-related injuries, because the, um, the safety concerns are not that great in these factories. And... One of the reasons that these factories are able to operate, they do, in what we would call the third world of Odd World, is that they're not under the scrutiny that comes more with the second and first world, the scrutiny of labor unions, human rights organizations, things like this. So they're able to happen in the cover of darkness in those different types of business practices because they're not exposed, right? Let's just look at that in the real world. Um, where did Nike's products come from? Who makes them? Right. Nike is just one. We could we can go down the list and listen, and listen. And you find out, you know, who's mining the silicon and the other key ingredients to batteries and, and chips? What are the people who are doing that mining? What do they look like? What's their day like? And Oddwell was originally sort of inspired off of like the diamond miners of South Africa, you know, people who had management that was carrying automatic weapons, right? <laughs> really abusive, terrible circumstances. So we look at the world today, terrible circumstances are happening. But by the time they're sold, you know, to a demographic in the first world, it's all with happy face logos and everything's great. And you're just getting your new iPhone or, or whatever. But these um, ironies and tragedies exist. And they're kind of, for me, they're just like fuel for cool stories. And it gives us a chance to touch on the things that aren't very popularly or widely discussed. 
And so I just find that great fodder for um, creating, you know, property in general. But back to the original question, if you can just refresh me on that. This tangent had a purpose. So the original question was about Abe and Alf covered in old scars. Yes, yes, yes. So the majority of those scars are just from <clears throat> work-related injuries. And if we were doing it a, let's say if, 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 uh, if the day comes where we can do like an, a networked linear streaming, you know, on one of the major Netflix-ish networks, I would hope that I, I feel like the whole first season could be taking place in Rupture Farms before they even escape. Like there's so much material about how they would live in that space, what their day-to-day -day moments are, that I feel there's just like all this huge possibility of just revealing their world and and could be really engaging. Abe as a midwife, you know, his role of helping uh, deliver cattle that was um, having problems giving birth, how that formed a deeper connection with him and the animals. All these things uh, relate to life in the factory and they're completely brainwashed. So they just think, you know, they're privileged to have this role that they play. And we get to find out, and Abe <clears throat> is our catalyst for finding out it's not that way at all. It's something quite different. So when injuries would happen, uh, it was kind of like the retirement plan. And the retirement plan would have been promoted within the factories on the walls and the things like that. I think at times they showed up, it's like so-and-so retired. Now he's having, you know, extra uh, sipping, uh, you know, uh, uh, drinks on an island down in the, down in the Yemen somewhere and um, frosty Pilatus. But you find out that's never what happened. Do you remember the movie Running Man with, uh, uh, I think it was, it was uh, Schwar Schwar Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger, right? Schwarzenegger, yeah. And it looked like the winners of it would go off and have these like fabulous retirement lifestyles of great vacations. But that wasn't the case at all, right? It was all, it was all just <laughs> propaganda. So what would happen is when people got severely hurt, it would depend, A, in the, in the workplace, who witnessed it. So if a bunch of people saw a mudok and get hurt, they'd be like, okay, well, we're taking them to the, to the, uh, you know, the, the nursery, which is what they would call where the, the medical emergencies would go. And then maybe you just never see them again, but you'd say like, oh, they got an early compensation and they got to retire. And now they're, you know, off in the place where all the mudokins like to retire. So it would be told this beautiful story, but really they're just being thrown in the meat bin, right? They're just kind of, adding to the uh, raw ingredients to the next treats. So it's kind of a horrible genocidal place <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that the people within it have no idea. And so it would be like, okay, we got to, we got to work to get these people in. And then you, if you were the one who hurt yourself, you would then enter these uh, through medical doors and you find out they're just there to take your organs and throw your body back into the, the bin of most appropriate meat usage for whatever products. So a horror behind the door that seems like it might be your your dream, and you find out no, it's hell. And so the Mudokins, they know that these things happen, they just don't know where it ends up. So they think like, oh, you know, like Tony, he got hurt, but man, he got that early retirement payout, and now we're seeing pictures of him, you know, postcards from this island and that island. What a life, you know, this is such a great place, but it's all a lie. And so uh, the idea was, was that you're looking at mostly work-related injuries. And then, you know, you get out of hand and the, the uh, slicks would beat your ass, give you a beating for fun. And so that was just like they'd always blame it on the Mudok. And this is just uh, proper management that's necessary to keep the ship rolling smoothly. So I hope that sheds some light on it. And it's always a little deeper than on the surface. Yeah, that's great. We, we love the deep insight for sure. So next question, another Moroccan question. This one's from Alien Insect. <laughs> Great handle. <laughs> yeah. When uh, Moroccans chant, uh, especially Abe, uh, do Moroccan deities and members of the afterlife give the living muds energy that they uh, channel through their bodies? Or do living muds channel spiritual energy to connect and communicate with the deities? Or, another or, lots of ors, uh, do the living muds receive a certain amount of spiritual energy at birth that make some of them good at chanting and others not so much? How does it all work? Well, there's a lot of topics right there in that relatively you know, short question, but it certainly opens up a lot of doors. So, so I would say um, bingo overall, like you're tapping into something very interesting here and what, where we thought it was coming from. So I, I would go back to Yoda, right? 
I would say the force li- runs through all living things and the force is my ally. And how do we get to the force? Why is it only the Jedi? So, and that's something that upset me with um, George Lucas's later, the last three movies was he started doing uh, that. It was a, ca- a crystal that was in people's blood that would make them either better for the force uh, con- conductivity or not. The thing I didn't like about that was it made it that there was a birthright of something really special and not something that was in everybody. And so I was like, oh, man, I, I didn't like that as a fan of Star Wars. I didn't like how all of a sudden, you know, there's a birthright and someone's born with that special ability. It's going to change everything. With Abe, I wanted to, um, and when we were shaping it in the beginning, we wanted to make sure that he really was an everyman, but something set him apart, something that he had access to, that everyone has access to, that the others weren't nurturing. And that was... Um, Abe's role as a midwife. So he'd be, you know, as a superintendent, you know, going around janitor, washing floors, shit like that. But the real gritty job was when cows were giving birth or, you know, whatever the species was that was giving birth. And there would be multiple species in ruptured farms that we never got to see just due to time and and budget. But they're similar cow-like creatures and similar pig-like creatures. And no one's seen the designs, but conceptually they were thought of. In that, when they would be having problems with giving birth, they would call on Abe because he just had that way to calm the animal and help get that, basically get that money of meat out without, you know, hurting the, the breeding cow or the calf. For lack of a better definition, I would just call them cow and calf. And for Abe, what made him special that everyone had is it really kept him innocent in the heart and it, it nurtured his heart. So he was always trying to understand the animals better. And that gave him a much better connection. And that gave them a deeper connection to him. And anyone who's ever like rescued animals or stuff like that, or you watch these videos where people are told, oh, you you grew up with that lion as a cub, but it's not going to remember you. And if you go back now, it's going to kill you, you know? And then you see the guy goes back 10 years later to a lion that he helped as a cub. And that lion comes out. (laughs) It's like the happiest day reunion in his life. He remembered who that was. So I always felt animals are much more powerful than we give them credit to, which goes to like the design of Munch's Odyssey and animal testing and things like that. Uh, but for Abe, what helped him be unique was he just, he was always nurturing his heart and he always wanted to stay positive. So he had this air of innocence and that's like a powerful thing. Like you're, if you're, if we're batteries and we're remotely charged by the universe, your heart is your connection. Then we get into the practices of faiths and religions or belief systems through the ages. And the, the spiritually, let's say the spiritually positive ones, we're always on the heart, empathy, sympathy, you know, generosity, selflessness, do unto others as you want done unto you, you know, all these sort of basic principles related about the heart, empathy, and connection, and caring. And they're in a world where they're being taught not to care, that these are just animals. They're not the same as you. You, you're, you have the right to slaughter them. They can be bred this way, et cetera, et cetera. So Abe was always trying to turn a blind eye to the negative practices. He never wanted to see the back end of the butchery. You know, he didn't want to see the slaughtering. He didn't want to see the terrible conditions at times of things that would happen to them. He just wanted to be friends with them. And um, there's a painting. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull it up for you guys if you give me a chance. This painting that we did for the, uh, fortunately, I have 50 terabytes on my local drive here. So if I go to uh, archives. I like that you've got a folder called archive. <laughs> yeah, it's literally, you know, it takes a little while. So I'll, I'll, I'll find this and I'll pull it out. But it shows all the ear tags. So after Abe would help the animals um, and then they would get slaughtered, the guys that were doing the slaughtering would give them back the ear tag. And so then you get back to his cell and you find out, remember the key keeper's room in uh, the matrix Yeah. and you walked in, it was just thousands of keys all over the hanging in that office for Abe. It was like that for the ear tags that came off of the cattle, the chattel, let's say. And so it's just covered in all these tags. There's a number and then written on top of the number is their name. So he always named the animals. So it was this heart connection that allowed Abe to become a mechanism that could channel something that the other Mudakins had lost. And that it was like, it was available to them. They just didn't, they didn't do what Abe did, 
which is he connected to things and helped them, and they did their job. So he winds up being this unique personality that's able to start doing things that others would consider supernatural. And with that, he aligns the sort, whole sort of spiritual energetic DNA of the, their history. And so he becomes a conduit for it. And the way he would have found chanting was, was secretly being messaged to him. And we'd never got a chance to see this yet. But what that would be is someone's leaving him notes. Someone is aware that he's becoming different. And we don't know who, right? And then it's, it's just like if you, and they'd give him a little song about animals. And then through that song, he would just do it because he was like, oh, this little makes the animals feel good. And that would eventually become the yo, 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 you know, that, that <laughs> suddenly was the right tone and the right frequency to start channeling this, this collective of energy that surrounds all living things, not only the Madakans, but it's really a Yoda type of operating system that Yoda would describe for the force. So that's really what distinguished Abe to be different. It wasn't that he was, you know, the one born to do this out of a royal family, out of some, you know, unique thing that makes him unique. I wanted to make sure that that wasn't the case with Abe, that he was something that we could all be. And that's kind of how it got there. And in that, uh, those that are paying attention from the old world of the Mudokans, like the Keeper, and that they are taking notice of this because they have spies everywhere. And they know they're living under this horrible oppression that the workers don't. And so Abe is secretly, even secret to him, he's being nurtured by something, someone that's leaving him hints on how to do what he cares about better. And that's what would have evolved his ability to have a chant and then be able to uh, possess. Thank you very much for that. Excellent. Okay, so moving on to the next question. This one is from Mudos Explorer. <laughs> nice, nice handle. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, could you tell us more about the the schism that happened between the Madokans and the Glockans? It's it's one of those things I hesitate on because we we've explored a number of different possibilities. I know you know anything I say can be held to me <laughs> in the future if if we change that slightly. So, given that license and that excuse first. I think there's a very interesting history with the history of our own world, especially when you get into the uh, mythologies of lost lands, you know, Atlantis. I'm going to mention a couple more that some on this chat may know, uh, I suspect. So you go Atlantis before Atlantis, Lumeria. Before Lumeria was uh, Mu. And these are like supposedly previous entire civilization epics that took place in the history of our world. And then as one goes to the dustbin of history, Eventually, it's just a race, and then they say, no, we began here. But there's possibly way deeper knowledge. Like, for example, you know, when I went to school, we were absolutely told that civilization is only really 4,000 years old. Before that, it was uh, people building, um, if they had any huts at all, they were made out of mammoth bones and leather skins. And then right after that, they just started making pyramids, right? And uh, I just always thought that was <laughs> the most ridiculous leap so I got really into ancient archaeology, not going out in the field, but just researching, researching, researching. And today we have cities that are being found in Turkey, like uh, Gobekli Tempe, which is uh, now proven to be 14,000 plus years old, right? That's not supposed to be there. The Sphinx is arguably 14,000 plus years old. It's not supposed to be there. It doesn't align with what the Smithsonian, the British Museum of History the Smithsonian Museum, uh, the authoritative uh, universities and stuff that claim to be experts in archaeology, they just say, oh, that's all nonsense. Don't pay attention to that. Just pay attention to this. They went from building tents made out of bone to pyramids <laughs> because uh, they didn't have to invent the arch yet. So uh, everything had to be in pyramid shape so they wouldn't fall over. <laughs> so you have these answers that are just really convenient to institutions, but a substantial degree of analysis just kind of breaks it apart. So I'm one who's very skeptical of history, what we're taught versus what possibly happened. You know, what happened is rarely recorded accurately. And so I'm not one of those people who believes that, oh, eventually all truths in history get discovered. Like, I don't believe that at all. I think there's way more bodies of truth in the graveyard than there are the uh, mysteries that we've solved, so to speak. But uh, trying, trying to sum that up, the Mudakans, if we go back to the tale of Atlantis, what they claim was that Atlantis had learned how to tap into something 
there was a natural harmonic force on this planet it related around gravity and frequency and iron and magnetics and things like this. And they were able to create a device that was sort of channeling planetary energy that then led to the earthquakes that then sunk their island, right? That's the popular myth of it. And if you watch the series Lost, uh, there was in the later episodes on the island in the series, they would start finding basically this pre-Atlantean technology and when they started like turning it on or something, this is the whole reason for the research center being on the island. When they turn it on, they couldn't turn it off and it would just keep on accelerating into something terrifying in terms of uh, power because it was like channeling the power of the planet. And so for the Mudakins, the idea in their history was that they had a pretty well-balanced civilization, but they were tapping into deeper and deeper energies. And energy is almost always the most sought after thing that a nation has or pursues like if you go what's the deepest clearance in military sectors it's always around energy so you go well nuclear is highest clearance right um and the reason is you know we're just everything we do is based off of energy so the mudakins got off track and tapped into something very powerful and i know we've talked about it different times different angles on this story but the one defining ultimate moment would be they fucked up and they created something that created really negative results. And as a result, they lost themselves in the power structure. And they sort of resorted themselves almost back to caveman. Because it was kind of like if an EMP weapon, electromagnetic pulse, whether from a sun flare or from a weapon, hit the planet in a major way today. In not too long, we'd be close to Stone Age again because everything that relied on our power source, electricity, would be fried. So I don't, I don't mean this as a big global singular statement, but in general, you know, there's a lot of scientists that would support that conclusion. And then there's all kinds of hypothesis off it. But in concept, you go, they tapped into something that they weren't mature enough and spiritually evolved enough to really handle. And the ones that were in control of the power were more like our political class today. They just weren't serving the needs of the wisest and the smartest. It would be like those that, like the keepers, you know, these things that were older than that, that goes back before those accidents. And they held on to something really strong, deep within themselves. It was an ancient, ancient, ancient knowledge. And so that's about the big chasm that was created. And that allowed others to evolve out and in a land of scarcity. So what I would say a big difference here was when the Mudokans had that control and they were the superiors, they had abundance. And so they didn't have to have factory farms. They didn't have this because if they, let's just say if they were had a city and they were doing uh, landscaping for that city, it would all be edible fruits. It would all be nuts and berries. It wouldn't just be pretty things to make companies look better, to make the street look nicer. It would be something everyone's walking around and it could just be eating food. So they had a different way of looking at it. And they lost that. And out of the scarcity, more brutal races emerged that were typically in swamps and damp conditions would often be associated with parasites. And the, then we can tap into later. I think there's a question about the vikers and trees. Um, we can tap on that. Yep. But they would have, these would have been evolving out of parasitic races that typically didn't have a chance to thrive. But when the Wadakan screwed it up, and, and others, the Mudokans weren't alone in this. There was other races that were very similar. And uh, they screwed it up. And then as a result, the power structure changed. They went back into a more primitive existence just out of necessity because they shut down. They killed their own power at great expense. And now other species emerged and they wanted the whole history of the Mudokans ever having this sort of superior position. They wanted that erased. So I, I hope that sheds light on it. That gets into the moon a little bit, but we've touched on that before. That was an epic answer. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> you bet. Okay, so final-ish question around that topic, and then we'll move on to some questions for the slugs. Sure. Uh, this one's from Shaved Meadows. <laughs> Shaved Meadows. Yeah. yeah. What was the first and the last species to achieve sapience, or at least some form of civilized state? I, I can't answer that question because I don't really know. And I say that because the way, way we always thought of Odd World was that it was much like our own world, full of surprises in different areas the more we would explore outwardly. 
So the way we've represented Oddworld so far is that we don't have much of an understanding beyond that which the enslaved workers had. So we wanted to kind of unlock the world through the eyes of our protagonists and their discovery. So we didn't want to get too far ahead of what they're learning, of what they're encountering. Kind of like in the Matrix, right? Like uh, Neo only got to know so much so so quickly. And then even when he knew a lot, he still was just at the beginning, you know, of learning how to become Ultima <laughs> Neo eventually, you know, <laughs> blind guy that could see. So I think there's a lot of emerging species. There's a lot of those that are, I have a personal philosophy, which I think given enough time in evolution, almost all things would become sentient unless like cockroaches, they just found this perfect foothold. Because cockroaches haven't changed in millions of years, right? We still hate them, but they're still here. <laughs> <laughs> I was just in a, in a, a hardware store this morning looking at the pesticide aisle. And there was like, you know, three elderly people there. And we just started laughing because everything on it was like, kills better, <laughs> murder them. You know, it was like, literally, this is like a whole aisle of how to kill things and uh, selling you, you know, chemical products, smoke out product, whatever. And we're in Arizona, so there's all kinds of big things crawling around. But um, that idea of given the opportunity, it felt like most things could evolve into sentience and that. I mean, there's a lot of different faith angles on this that people have or science angles. But I, I think like spiritual evolution is a thing. And, um, you know, I remember getting arguments sometimes. People like, well, what do you believe in? You know, creation or evolution? I say, well, I'm an evolutionary creationist, you know, so it's kind of tough to figure out. I just have this inherent sort of faith that I think uh, will is a massive factor in biological evolution not random mutation of uh, cells from the sun and gamma rays and x-rays and things like that, that I was taught in school. I think will, an individual's will, has a huge impact on their DNA and on their line going forward. And I think there's more and more scientific evidence coming out to sort of support that. Like we can change our own DNA over time. And so there, the idea was, was that there would be sentience emerging all over, given the need for something to uh, survive in, under a new circumstance. And I think that's what really drives uh, evolution is the need for it. Meaning, you know, if we look at Darwin's turtles, the turtles of the Galapagos, you know, those that had to reach higher branches had shells shaped differently. And if we just, you know, are comparing like science models versus faith models versus spiritual models, my take was, was that sentience can emerge anywhere. And even with good and bad uh, races of people, you know, because I don't, I don't think, even that within that, right, we could say, well, during World War II, you know, the Nazis, just the absolute worst, and anyone who was supporting the you know, absolute worst, then you get closer to the stories, and you're like, wow, what people went through. You know, some people went through the most horrible things and came out being more enlightened because of it. Their circumstances were challenged at, at kind of a superhuman level, and they were faced with, like, um, just give up and die, give in and do things you don't believe in just to survive, you know, become corrupt, or transcend and become something more. And um, I've listened to witness testimonies on all ends of the spectrum on things like that. And uh, you're just amazed at some of the most precious, empathetic minds and people have seen some of the most horrific possibilities. And I think without the horrific possibilities, I, I don't know that those people would have evolved in the sort of glorious way that they did, where they become people that we envy in terms of uh, their capacity to care about others and do good things, no matter what the scale and who they're helping. So sentience emerges everywhere and uh, the same with corruption. So I hope that answers it, <laughs> if, if that works. Yeah, that definitely works. Thank you very much for that. You bet. So uh, next question, we're going to move on to talking a, a little bit about the slicks. So the, this question is from Mockingbird. It says, my question is related to the slicks. Are they fully aware that their mother is also their queen who hates them and often might want to eat them? And um, if this is the case, why do they call their mother for help when they feel in danger? <laughs> and uh, if this isn't the case, did the Gluckens uh, lie to them like they did for the Madokans about Sam? And Mockingbird says, thank you and may the odd be with you all. Great question. Okay, so... Um we had designed how Sligs birth and the mother is a queen in the super species sense. 
And uh, this got into the character Skillia, who uh, we had talked about at times, but uh, just didn't have a chance to show yet, right? But imagine a mother who gives birth to hundreds of young at the same time, but her process of labor is so painful that she just hates them (laughs) as soon as they come out. Because in her case, it's also a fasting. So they gestate this massive amount of young inside themselves, but then to give birth, they have to go into a fast. And so that if you had someone who really loved fine dining, (laughs) they're just resenting the fast that they have to do to produce the young. And so by the time they give birth, they're in extreme pain of the labor of it. And they're really hungry. So we had like this idea, some, some spiders start eating their young right away. And there's some species that will start eating their young right away, but they just have so many young that a lot of them get away. And there's some spiders like that, some other insects like that. I believe there's, you know, some uh, fish like that for sure. Reptiles, amphibians. So I found that really fascinating. You know, what if your mother was so pissed off at birth? She was just, you know, they're being born in this horrible circumstance. And then as they're trying to flee, the mother's like reaching down and picking them up and eating them. So that would be the lovely, loving touch of Mama Scylla. In this case, you know, being one of these sleep queens. But we back it up to why. And why is, is that as fiefdoms get created, as nations get created, those in the um, inner circles wind up, you know, if you were part of the English when they were fighting with Scotland and uh, taking control, you know, most Scottish people can tell you the horrors that were happening and just the cronyism of who would be made a mayor, who would be made a lord, who would be made a sheriff, the rights that they had, the rights that the nation under the conquest that they lost, you know, just have all these terrible circumstances that have happened through history people doing unto others. So the the beginning of this formation, let's say post-Atlantis, where the Mudokans had lost their grace and now other things were emerging under a condition of scarcity, as they started shaping into societies and cultures and industries to supply the rest under this scarcity model, the fiefdom would start getting cut up with those who could supply the rules and could supply the labor for what would be needed to manage these new systems. And so the sligs made kind of perfect security guards in the dumbest sense. You know, like if we look at um, security guards in more like a a South Park kind of way, (laughs) it's not, I don't mean to demean anyone who's a security guard at all, but I just mean this kind of a classic image of the lazy guy reading porn at night, sitting around doing nothing else because he's on watch, you know, see it in lots of movies and stuff. So the idea that you had, um, the need for lots of security. And that meant non-sympathetic people that have been, or say groups that have been traumatized or species that sort of have been traumatized and was now callous and could do cruel things to others and not care about it because they had sort of been born out of that trauma themselves. So that became the sligs as security guards. They were really convenient security guards. They were things that were originally like swamp creatures. So they moved around in dark, damp areas and then eventually with mechanical legs, they could move around. And, and then we never got into like the hydration packs they would need, <laughs> the pills and stuff like that. We just never got a chance to get into these details. But the idea was, was that they were born under such terrible circumstance that then they weren't empathetic. And so they're perfect for this role. And the reason that Slick Queen would just like have them rather than, you know, have them aborted or be sterile or whatever, is because they were too valuable. If she could give a brood of hundreds, that was hundreds of characters that would eventually be in her of security, let's let's call it private security individuals that would eventually be in her corporation. And there would be many different sleek queens with different entities, like one would be Blackwater, another might be, uh, you know, (laughs) another, another group of private security, right, if you know who Blackwater is. So then in that, they were born for the role because their birth was so cruel and what they witnessed was terrifying that they just didn't grow up with that empathy. And anyone who's gotten into like history of mind control and stuff like that and really got into it, which I I don't suggest you do because it's so dark, but anyone who did knows that if you can traumatize youth at, at certain ages, you can really condition them to do inhuman things as a regular practice and enjoy it. So the sleeves were perfect for this role. And for the Slink Queens, they had the opportunity to start producing security for this new model of nation 
that was emerging. And this would have been, you know, thousands of years ago on opera. And so those practices continued to prevail and those wealth systems became more deeply entrenched into equivalents of what we might call, you know, royalty in the world that's prevailing to this day that's bloodlines go back, you know, possibly thousands of years. And so they were more of the now entitled class and the way they were born led to their capability for uh, an industry that needed that kind of uh, callous psychosis. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. You bet. Um, we've got, got another question that kind of relates a little bit to that. This one's from Haley Rose asking, are slicks born with reasonably kind personalities or are they trained to be bad or are they just bad by nature? Well, this is like if you could have separated one before before they got out and met Mama, you know, they might have been like you know like Yoda slick, right? Like they still have hearts, they still have connection to the planet. They're still evolving with biological matter that's native to the planet. And I know there's some questions around that coming up, but uh, my feeling is the capability is always possible. Like in the United States, stories I'd always be really curious about would be. Um, I remember there was someone who was part of a uh, anti-Semitic white supremacist group that was like a small group, but these these people were really you know passionate about it, and radical about it. It might have been a faction, the KKK or something like that. I don't remember exactly. It was a long time ago. And then the irony was, then it was revealed through DNA testing that the like chief of all this hatred against Jewish people was actually Jewish. And they just didn't know it, right? So it's kind of like, you know, it's harder when you're a different color. You know, like you'd be like, okay, I'm black and you're mocha and you're this tone and you're that tone. So you most likely came from this part of the world, et cetera, et cetera. At least the DNA lineage. But when you get into like, you could hate somebody that you find out you are, those stories always fascinate me. Like how knowledge can flip an entrenched idealism that someone has. And the simplest knowledge is like, you find out you're not what you thought you were. And then you find out you would have been a victim of those who believe like you. So I just am always fascinated by the possibilities of realization, changing people's perspectives and uh, changing their, their very nature. So in that, I just come back to how we were raised, what we learn, what we do, how we behave can change us no matter probably wherever we came from, whoever we came from. And uh, I think it was Himmler who said, gives the children to seven, and then we don't care who does what with them later. They'll always believe our our mind control, basically. If you give us the chance to raise them till seven, anyone else can have them and they'll still be ours. And that always, you know, I find that kind of terrifying. So these roles just continue to, uh, for me, they, they just drive that creation process for characters and dilemma. I think it's rich, rich soil to feed from. Interesting. Th thank you for that. Yep. So uh, next question. This is from uh, Hansu Oddi. What would a slig's average lifespan be if they weren't smoking all the time and actually had healthy, normal slig lives, <laughs> if that's possible? <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that, but what I do know is this, and, and we always had to be careful how we showed smoking in a game because uh, different um, ratings, and if we ever show a character smoking that you play or is shown in a positive light, uh, you'll get a mature rating immediately. So in games, there's a sensitivity to that. If you're going to a mature rating and you're Grand Theft Auto V, you know, <laughs> all the possibilities become yours because you're already in mature only ratings. On that, we didn't show the slick smoking as much as we wanted to because then you would be possessing them and you might be possessing characters that were smoking and then we'd have different regulation rules. So this is kind of boring stuff, but it actually shapes how you have to make some choices. But what we wanted was the sleeks were like cigarette smoking fiends, you know, like if they were low on cigarettes, then the Dawkins would have like a little black market and be like, hey, man, we can, get, we can still get you some. And what can you get them? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I know people that are uh, preppers, you know, like in Utah or something. They're like they have stills and they, and they store tobacco because in their mind they go like if all the goods stop flowing, the people that smoke and the people that drink, they're going to do anything to get that habit satiated so it's like coffee beans tobacco and alcohol right some people are stockpiling food other people are stockpiling tobacco alcohol 
And other people are stockpiling things from the hardware store. Yeah, exactly. And then they're like, well, um, I won't have the food everyone wants, but I'll be able to trade it for a premium because all I need is a, a few alcoholics and they'll give me whatever it takes to get their fix. Not to make light of those things. So we wanted to show the slicks like just these chain smoking guys and we're always, you know, doing this and that. And uh, they would always have that conversation. But it was because of the ratings that we toned back on that. And part of the status of that was the Sligs would smoke pre-rolled cigarettes out of the pack. If there was any Mudokin smoking, they would like be able to find some tobacco and roll it themselves. If there was the Gluckins, they would never touch cigarettes. They would never touch pre-rolled. They'd only be smoking like, you know, uh, the most expensive cigars from their equivalent of Havana, wherever the, you know, the Cohibos, like many hundreds of dollars per cigar. There, there are cigars like that. So it was kind of a status, too, of like, what do you smoke? If you remember in the marketing of cigarettes to women, they started making cigarettes thinner and longer because they just look more uh, lean and sexy and and uh, feminine, right? So they changed the shape of the cigarette because they wanted to sell more to women. And so there's status in all of these habits, there's status in all these consumption patterns. And so the Gluckins were smoking the real stuff, you know, the expensive hand-rolled cigars. The Sligs were smoking the stuff out of factories, and then the lowest class would be smoking stuff that they grew in their backyards or whatever, you know, they, that they'd find growing. Like at one time, you know, people did. You just found, you were like, what the hell is this? Tobacco, it's growing, you know. That goes back in our history thousands and thousands of years. I mean, tobacco was big in history and throughout history, along with mushrooms and marijuana and things like that, too. But, uh, yeah, so I don't know what a sleep slash plan would really be. We, we, it'd be a good test, you know. It's a good, it's a good story there is uh, rehab for slakes, the one who's trying to quit smoking and <laughs> how hard it is in the community of <laughs> fellow smokers that make fun of you once you start to quit. I don't know. I love the question. Though. Okay, cool. Well, maybe we can come back to that thought, chain of thought or chain of smoke uh, later on. Okay, so the next question is from uh, Leonardo Di Scrabio, I will say, and says, can you tell us more about the big bro slig depicted in the concept art that can be found inside Abe's Origins? He has tattoos on the forearms, a spiked helmet, and a smoking pipe. Is this a uh, concept for Stranger's Wrath? So I don't remember exactly... Um... The Big Bro Sligs first appeared in Munch's Odyssey, and that's when we did the most exploration around them. And so um, a lot of what was happening there was exploration. But what we wanted was the big ones, which is uh, most super species, if we look at the insect kingdom, have like the drones and then the soldiers and this and the, the, the few that breed and then the rest that, that do the work and, and fight for the colony, and et cetera, et cetera. So that Big Bro Slig was – explored the we had them in Munch's Odyssey, but the idea was they were basically the soldiers and the little slings were more like the workers, the drones. So they weren't as big and they weren't as strong, but the soldier class, they were like formidable. You know, they were the Arnold Schwarzenegger of slings. In that, it was just kind of the hierarchical model of how super species work. And that's what allowed us to touch in on them. And then we just wanted these really like heavies, these tank four wheel four wheel legged big tough guys and uh they would be like that next level of security that you'd call in during an uprising and actually we had hoped to have that a number of times in different games in stranger we wanted to do it but we really wanted to take the opportunity to create almost an entirely new cast that took place in a slightly different location in Soulstorm, we wanted to have it that when Abe and the Budokans finally got to Soulstorm Brewery, that they would be radioing in for help, and we'd have these uh, airdrops coming in of these big bro slicks. And, um, you know, those things got on the cutting room floor to uh, time and energy and budget and things like that. But that was the essence of what was driving the creation of the big bro slicks. So you could think of them more like special forces versus slicks being the average grunt. And when they'd show up, it was supposed to be really bad. Like, you know, you're in trouble. When it comes to the the tattoos, the uh, spiked helmet, the smoking pipe, some of those ideas that we're playing with, that was about creating irony in character. So you go like, he looks like this, but why has he got a peace sign tattoo? You know, I'm just, just like throwing out some random thoughts. But why is he smoking like a professor's pipe? 
does that mean he thinks he's more sophisticated than the others? And I know for the UK people, it might get upset because I still see a lot of the old style curved pipes kind of synonymous with uh, professor, you know, deans of schools, you know, so sort of sitting around in your library smoking this fabulous pipe. And so we were playing, I was encouraging the designers to play with objects like that to contradict the image you're looking at. You know, you'd be like, he looks like this, but why is he playing with a doll? You know, like things that create curiosity that make you want to know more about the character. Someone who does that really beautifully, I think, is Bobby Cho. And uh, his other half, uh, Kay, she does it beautifully as well. Um, that's Imaginism Studios and Schoolism. But what he has this ability to do is to have this really kind of terrible looking thing. And then it's holding a little butterfly that it's just mesmerized by, you know, and it just completely melts your heart about the character who's supposed to be big and scary. And Bobby's got that. He's always got it in so many of his images. Those of you that are familiar with his work, you'll, you'll immediately um, resonate with what I'm pointing at. So the design there initially to sort of create contradiction, we go, that's the last guy I'd expect to see smoking a pipe like that. So now I'm more curious about what is, what is he like? What, is he, what does he sound like when he talks? What does he do? What's his job? So that, that's what drives a lot of that counterbalancing, I, I would call it. And, and I hope that answers that. Yep. Thank you for that. You bet. The next question is from uh, DeCestia. Is the chauffeur slig the same slig that accompanies Moloch during the boardroom meeting and Abe's execution? Y yes. It, it, so that's the same slig, but we never saw him in his pilot hat before because he wasn't flying. And then he got zapped in Rupture Farms as well, but he didn't get it quite as hard as Moloch, but it was enough to knock him out. And so now they share this little bit of a bonding because they suffered the tragedy together. You know, Moloch's still boss, but that's what's giving the Slig a little more feeling that he can get away with saying a little more things. He can be a little more open and honest to his boss, which isn't necessarily good for his health, but that's what set up that condition. Same Slig. Okay, cool. Next one from White Knight. Which species makes better soldiers? Slicks, interns, or wolvarks? So the interns were, in, were inspired by uh, those of you who saw the original Dune, um, Baron Harkonnen it, on his home world, his assistance to make sure they didn't overhear or see anything that they shouldn't hear or see, they would have their ears sewn shut and have special glasses on or whatever that would just be presenting the reality, reality they were supposed to see instead of one the management didn't want them to see. It was just it was like ugh, cruel, almost like... Uh, creating eunuchs of anyone who was going to be serving princesses or queens, right? They didn't want them ever being tempted, so they just castrate them. And I just thought that was always so cruel. But so for the interns, it was more like they served the Vikers well because they weren't as heavy-handed, and they would be better around laboratories where, you know, like they shouldn't see much, they shouldn't know much, they shouldn't talk about much, they shouldn't hear much, they should just follow orders. So they wouldn't be the toughest for sure. The sligs are powers and numbers. So it's kind of like the dumbest biker gang you could imagine. That would be like the sligs, right? <laughs> if they were on their own, they'd just be partying it up and going crazy and criminally involved and, you know, have all that, but not super sophisticated. And the Walvarks, they weren't very intelligent and they were ultimately inspired by inbreeding. I don't want to show some of the photographs of what they were originally inspired by because it's actual people that were, you know, like twins inbred. But they were inspired by that. It was like there's a group of people that look a certain way because of incest. <laughs> you guys probably think, like, why does this guy talk about this crazy stuff? We just want to know about the game. But these are the ideas of what inspires the characters and stuff. It was, I was like, okay, so if there was kind of a race of inbreds, you know, how would they behave? What do they look like? We're actually modeling off of these faces of um, a couple of people that were brothers. I was like, if we can capture that, you know, the way the ears are, the way the head's a little more shaped, like cone, you know, the, all these bizarre features. And we were trying to capture that in the Walvarks. So they weren't super intelligent, but they were pretty badass. And they were more crocodile in origin and the DNA. So they were also just cold-blooded reptilians. So in the case of Sligs versus uh, interns or Walvarks, I'd say the Walvarks have more muscle, and uh, it would be it would be tough to to beat all the Walvarks. Is what I should say. 
The Vikers would employ Walvarks too. We just haven't seen that. I mean, I think everyone's capable of employing Walvarks because they're very similar to the other groups where these are family models and the offspring are, are rented and leased into services of different powerful groups. But I, I'd have to give it to the Walvarks unless we conclude the big bro slicks. And then, then it's like, I think the big bro slicks would have it. Okay. Thanks for that. Odd world is truly odd. <laughs> So next couple of questions about the the Vikers, and they were a little bit related about the origin of the Vikers and also, you know, what was their natural habitat. But I think I'll probably touch on a question which is more probably encompassing, which is from Vlam and says, according yeah. to the canon, and I haven't fact-checked this, so we'll see if this is canon, the Vikers come from species that once lived in trees. They still have a tendency to try and live in the air. Could you tell the community any more about the background of the species? Sure. And we're going back, give me the license of uh, memory in that we're going back to around 2000 when these characters were being uh, developed. So that's, you know, 22 years ago. But that said, the idea there was there's a lot of vulnerable species that head up trees, right? Like squirrels and things that run away from predators. They'll run up trees, things that bears eat, things that cats eat. And uh, there was like, we, there was these potato bugs that we have. I don't, I don't know where we're distributed in the world, but we have them in the uh, Western United States where they're just like this big, ugly, huge, pale looking bug that seems really soft and gooey, but it still has legs like an insect and has some sharp things around it. They're really creepy, but apparently they don't, you know, they don't bite you or anything. But we were like, huh, where, how, do they, how do they live? You know, that's a really creepy thing. And if you look at a potato bug and then you think about the vikers, you might get an extraction of like how these limbs would be, what they were walking on, et cetera. You know, there's always different theories that we're approaching on what would their backstory be. But I, I think it originated here, which is things that go into trees find safety in being off the ground where the predators are. And almost everything we talk about, right, has an evolutionary history. So I'm just kind of touching on that. And there's a vulnerability, and then they don't have hard shells. They don't have big teeth. They don't have a lot of things going for them that would make them super predators. So they were usually just eaten by predators. So the vikers in their evolutionary ladder would have been this uh, potato bug-like species that is pretty soft, pretty vulnerable, not very powerful, but they were growing big heads. They were growing big brains. And so where they found their lot in the civilization emerging was in more mathematical things, chemical things, chemistry, uh, and they would sell those services like big pharma. And the idea then was that in their lineage, they just felt safer above the ground. So then they got more into blimps if they had a, uh, let's say, a bioweapons lab that they were developing. And you could bet the Vikers are all in on that business, too. So while they're supplying uh, so-called medicine to one market, they're supplying weapons to kill to another market. But it's all coming out of the same labs. So to keep those labs safer, they just thought they'd take to the air because that was in their lineage to do so. So I hope that helps. But that was the basic essence of the idea that something that found shelter in trees, what would happen in two million years of its evolution, if it became a sentient being, if it was running businesses, what are its genetic, we call it instinctual tendencies that would drive what created the type of world it's living in now or the circumstances it lives in? So I hope that sheds light on it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So the next question is from Impavita. Being a fan of all games in the Oddworld franchise has led me to a theory that I hope you can elaborate on. Was Secto part of the same species of the Gluckens? It's always wondered because Secto has similarities to Gluckens, even though the Magog's cartel logo and Secto's look kind of vaguely similar. Yeah, so th the answer is yes. Um, good observation. But the Galactici, which is their race of, the, of Secto's race, they're way higher on the DNA ladder from the Gluckens. So if you imagine like, you know, humans and Neanderthals, there's a certain point where they split off, right? In the evolutionary tree as, as it's been modeled for us. And if you can imagine that there was a race that found it could be more successful by parasiting on top of other hosts. So the Gluckins were natural at that anyway, but they did it in an exploiting way. They didn't do it in a physical way. The Galactici are kind of like ticks or tapeworms, or there's certain types of wasps 
that sting and take over the minds of other types of insects. Like this actually happens right in, the, in our world today, like chemical mind control. Um, they plant their eggs in the body and the eggs eat the brain of the victim, the parasite. You know, it's just like, it's like <laughs> what these terrible, terrible things. And I was like, Oh man, you know, we got to bring that into uh, civilization and technology and uh, sentient beings. And what does that then look like? So that's what drove a lot of that. But the idea with the Galactagai is what they do is they seek hosts. So they are much more powerful because they're not just like the Gluckens are bound by their awkward arms that they walk on and their dangling legs and they're kind of evolving past the need to use their hands. And that was one of the jokes of their design is they never have to lift a finger. Someone else is always doing all the work. And so they could just walk on their hands because they didn't really need their hands for much. So that's the sarcasm of it. But the Galacta guy was more like they would have, like if they had a closet, it would have multiple bodies in there that they could attach to and then get dressed and then, and then go to work, right? So they, they were parasites that could take over the minds of whatever they wrapped their head around. And in the case of uh, Stranger's Wrath, you know, sick. no one had seen the older Steve. There used to be a Steve that protected the rivers. No one had seen it, but a new industrialist came in and started damming it and turning it into pri private water uh, facilities and selling it off to other places in the world, but denying it to all the people that had lived with that river downstream. And so they were like, the old Steef disappeared when Secto arrived. But it was really Secto infected the old Steef. And then because he had bank accounts and, you know, now he had arms again and limbs again, he had infected the protector. And now the protector had become the thief and the enforcer, you know, the tyrant. And then we find out at the end of Stranger's Wrath that it was actually a parasite and it was a Glock, the guy. So they're related, but if we said like, well, chimpanzees is this location on the evolutionary chart and then homo sapiens up here. And I don't mean to say that in a superior sense, but I just mean, you know, one evolved out of the other. The Gluckens and the Glocticae broke off in their evolutionary history and the Glocticae became way more powerful because they could take over other things. And when they took them over, they would have their full knowledge as well. So there, it was kind of like a, you know, there's lots of movies where a mind control comes in and uh, the being inside is fighting it, but can't, right? A lot of sci-fi and shit does stuff like that. So that was that was the, the Glockta guy. They are related to the Gluckens, but they're different and they're more powerful and they're more dangerous. Awesome. We just got a couple of questions left before we wrap up today, uh, if that's okay. Yeah. This one's from Oxide. <laughs> I love these handles. <laughs> uh, do all Gluckens aspire to work in finance and management positions, or do others go for different careers? And was the North Jersey Mafia an inspiration for Gluckin speech and behavior? Uh, great question. So the Gluckens better aspire to C-level positions or management executive class positions because that's what they were bred to do and that's what their mamas make sure they do so if a if a gluckin said to his mom his queen uh you know i don't really want to pursue the family business of uh you know running these corporations for all these other types of families and stuff i just want to go out and start my little hippie leather shop and and i want to make aprons for people and sandals um that would be really bad for that gluckin it would be like i raised you I raised you to do a purpose, you know, and that purpose isn't, you know, you could just imagine the, the dragon mom of, uh, of elites and royals and things like that. It's kind of like you were bred to be a CEO and you want to be a janitor. No, no, no. You know, they might send you away to a uh, <laughs> school to fix that in you. So Gluckins were born to run the companies of the really wealthy. Now, in the history of the tales that we've told so far, you, it, it kind of seems like, you know, Gluckin was, you know, Gluckin was just at top of that food chain. No, eventually you find out they're like Abe, just on a whole nother level behind more walls of secrecy from what the common folk understand versus how the elites would operate. And so uh, in all of that, they are born for that job. And there's a couple of great books that have been written at different times. Um, there was one uh, a video, a documentary, I think it was called Thrive. And whether or not we believe it, but it was the heirs to a big, um, big corporation, heir to a big corporation. I think it was Procter & Gamble. 
And he goes, look, I was bred for this role. And I'm telling you, it's bad for you, right? And they're hiding this information from you. Whether or not you believe it, it's really interesting idea that there are certain people, we think they're on the top, but they're really just soldiers on another level working for the really powerful. And the really powerful, you, you might not have ever heard of, but you've heard of these ones that are working for them, and you think they're the most powerful. So that's deep in the lore of Oddworld, in this, you know, the hierarchy of um, where all that goes. But you would find renegade like Gluckens that just flew the coop. And then they're out there, you know, and maybe they have like a, you know, a, a roll your own cigarette uh, side, side stand <laughs> somewhere, like a taco stand. You know, I don't know. I just like being in the sunshine. And, you know, so you're always going to find that um, we used to call them trustafarians which is uh, you had a, you had a trust, <laughs> you inherited a trust so you could go around the world with dreadlocks and go to the ski resorts or chase the waves as surf, whatever it is, you know, but you kind of had a good head start because you, you inherited a trust fund and ski slopes and stuff. I just remember people saying, Oh, it's trust the farians, which is you, you were entitled to go off and do your own thing. But the, the Gluckins, yeah, I would love to see uh, the exploration of the Gluckins that rebelled against the system. And, and in my makeup, of the choice of individuality and species is they all have a free will. So you may be indoctrinated to do something, but you know, something may happen and you wish you could burn down the system, but you can't. So you just flee and then you open up a taco stand somewhere. <laughs> this story just told to me by a retired military guy. He goes, I just wanted a taco stand. And they were trying to give him like intelligence jobs and stuff like that. And they're like, why do you want a taco stand? He goes, I love tacos. And I like, you know, serving people. And I, I think, uh, uh that's what, that's what I want to do with my retirement. He had all this knowledge. He just wanted a taco stand. So anyway. Cool. And the inspiration for that speech and behavior? Yeah, it's definitely mafiosos. And um, coming from the Northeast, uh, it's not uncommon to actually you know, know mafiosos. There's something kind of hilarious about extremely dangerous people. And I don't mean to belittle crimes or pains on other people or something like that, but on the, on the East Coast, uh, there was a lot of history with mafias. I had a stepfather who was from Providence, Rhode Island. Anyone who knows the, the history of Providence, Rhode Island, and corruption and things like this. Um, and in New York, uh, New York's kind of infamously saturated with mafiosos in, in various levels. And I learned a lot of things, and I wound up meeting a number of people that were. One of the things that I found the most amazing later in life was when I'd meet some of these billionaires, and I met a lot in my journeys. I'd be like, man, they talk just like mafiosos. <laughs> like, really, you know, everything in life is a negotiation. You know, like you, you couldn't tell. Is that the guy who just sold the investment fund, or is that the guy who's, who's running the after hours gambling joints? And I learned a lot of interesting things about organized crime with different groups, and not from being a participant, but just you know, it's a small world. And the mafiosos cracked me up because they were always like funny, you know. Uh, I know a guy recently, he came out of Mexico and had to flee with cartel stuff and family being in police, and that became a bad thing. It, it, all really terrible. But part of this was his family. And I was like, well, what was that? Like, he was like, you know, this is that. And it became a problem. So, you know, we left 15 years ago, whatever. And I said, so were they a lot of fun to party with? And he looks at me and he goes, so much fun. <laughs> And it was, it's kind of like uh, Goodfellas or something, you know, uh, if you saw that group in the corner of the bar on a night, you know, they're the ones that look like they're having the most fun. And there was something about the twang of how they talked to answer directly. It wasn't Jersey for me. It was more the Bronx and Providence. Uh, not that there's a Rhode Island or Bostonian accent in there, but yeah. So it was definitely mafioso type influences for these characters. And then um, I just happened to know back in the 80s that someone would say, I got to go see the bosses, like the big bosses. And you'd think, you know, maybe they're going to an area in Little Italy or something like that. No, they were going to the highest stories in the World Trade Center. Right. So it was like, wow, people think it's one thing. But then you find out the guys and they start shitting their pants because they got to go report upstairs. But they seem like there was someone in the Bronx or Brooklyn or something like that. You know, so the neighborhood, they're like a Tony Soprano. Right. But now Tony's got to go see the big people and they're not living like the rest of the mafiosos. You can't distinguish them from the top earners of Wall Street. And that's who, you know, they'd have to report to someone at that level of society. And those people were, you know, much more big and powerful and scary. 
So without, you know, names and dates and shit like that, like I, I learned that that was real. And out of that, it was like, there, there was also something like a criminal class oftentimes has a way of developing another level of charm, you know, and maybe it's survival skills or something like that. But some of the most charming people you ever meet, if you watch, uh, there's a UK YouTuber who uh, did time in the United States. He was the biggest uh, e-trafficker for ecstasy in the United States. And he was in prison in Arizona. And now he has a huge podcast and all he does is interview former people who've done time, mafia hitmen, mafia bosses, famous mafiosos. And if you ever watch his interviews with some of these mafiosos, one of the things is, um, and I'm not painting anything in a positive light, I'm just saying really charming, like really witty, really funny, really charming. And if you look at the mob bosses that would be on trial in New York City, so like through the 80s and 90s, the courtroom is oftentimes just laughing with them because their answers are so fast, so witty, and so funny, and so kind of indifferent and casual. It can be hilarious. And so I think Scorsese really plays off of that. Like, in any time you're portraying a bad guy, you're trying to find the thing that people will make that character appealing, that they actually like him. And then they are kind of like, damn, I like him, but he's a really bad guy. And that makes great bad guys. So, yes, definitely inspired by mafias. Awesome. Really appreciate that insight. My pleasure. I'll have to check out some of those videos in that podcast for sure. Oh, yeah. Final question. This one's from uh, Senzu Sensei and asks, has the Magog Cartel ever made it off planet or are they just confined to Mudos? So um, not just Mudos. You could think of them as, as more, for lack of a better word, globalists, meaning like global uh, multinational corporations. And a Mudos is just where our story has begun. And that's where the Magog cartel has a serious foothold, but it wouldn't be isolated to Mudos. And uh, they haven't gone off planet. And then the, the real question would be, um, what's prohibiting them from going off planet? And then we get into who made the moon, who made the, the handprint in the moon. And so I would say that, I mentioned this before, does the ET presence uh, maybe it had more history in the history of that world back when the Mudokans, um, before they fell, or I'd call it the fall of the Mudokans. And there's the ET presence. And then the question is, what really is it doing? And what influence would it have over these powers that might be keeping them on the world, prohibiting them from going off world? I think this is probably going to open, open but, up more questions. Yeah. And, I, and I'd say that's the. That's the same presence that, that put the handprint in the moon, like long ago. Okay, interesting. We might have to pick your brains <laughs> f- further in the future on, on this. I'm sure there'll be like lots of questions coming through. <laughs> yeah, I enjoy them. I really do. Okay, awesome. Well, that's all the time uh, we have on the clock today for your questions. Uh, we really appreciate them all. Hope you liked um, different format. Uh, let us know in the Discord, in the comments on YouTube. Any feedback, suggestions, we'll we'll incorporate it into uh, next show. So, Lorne, as always, I love taking time with yourself and, and, and you being here with the community and everyone loves uh, tuning in live and also listening afterwards. Next episode is episode five, and that's coming towards the end of July. And in that episode, we're going to discover the wildlife of odd world so we're going to look at scraps logs paramites fuzzles and anything else that the community would like to talk about please as always go to the discord discord.gg forward slash odd world and ask the odds for how you can ask questions to the next show uh, this show will be as a podcast on anchor.fm forward slash odd world inc we'll share the links on discord as always we appreciate your patience while we finish the edit and if you're listening on the podcast, hello to you. A reminder, you can always join us live, and details of that are on the official Discord, discord.gg forward slash oddworld. Uh, we'll be sharing a few clips on our socials so you can catch up with uh, some of the best bits. And remember, you can now buy Oddworld Soulstorm on Steam and also enjoy the demo. So that's all for now. 
big thank you to Lorne as always for joining. Thank you for tuning in and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Okay, cheers. Cheers. Bye.